Our next presentation is from Valerie Korinek from the Department of History at the University of Saskatchewan. Valerie is one of Canada's leading historians of cultural and gender history. A professor of history at the University of Saskatchewan, Dr. Korinek is the author of award-winning books on queer communities, women's culture, history, and food history. In Prairie Fairies, she provides an inclusive, accessible history of queer people, communities, and activism in the West. Dr. Korinek's ambitious and innovative studies have fundamentally shaped how Canadian historians understand feminist and sexualities histories. In a world of constant change and upheaval, we need various tools and disciplinary perspectives to understand how change happens. As a cultural and gender historian, naturally my lens is historical. Today, I want to boil my research down to four words, feminism, queer communities, and marriage. Those four words are at the heart of my career, seeking to query change, researching and writing activist and social justice histories. The F word feminism is a polarizing one for some, but feminist activism and activity has been a vital driver of change in Canadian society. My first book, Roughing It in the Suburbs, explored the feminist messages of Chatelaine magazine in the 50s and 60s. Contrary to the stereotypical images we hold of those decades, we now realize that the 50s and 60s were the beginning of dramatic social changes. During those two decades, one very important Canadian voice for second wave feminist activity was Chatelaine Magazine, then the country's largest circulation magazine. Within those pages was a rather subversive mix of articles and editorials devoted to sexual assault, women's health, pay inequity, divorce, sexuality, amongst others. Editor Doris Anderson and her team got away with this because they packaged that feminism with heaping spoonfuls of sugar, fashion, food, decorating tips, and advertisements. Those ads made Chatelaine a commercial success. And that would enable the sustained attention to feminist content. Readers responded and circulation grew. Chatelaine created a vibrant community of readers via their Mrs. Chatelaine contest and a mixture of readers' letters published on the back page called The Last Word is Yours. In Prairie Fairies, my research questions shifted to another series of activists and social justice concerns, queer communities and politics. The term queer, another one that includes as much as it divides, was used intentionally to enable writing and analyzing a range of sexual and gendered behavior that people engaged in prior to the emergence of sexual identity politics in the late 60s. Today, the 2S LGBT communities have many terms to describe ourselves, but prior to the late 60s, certainly in the prairies, openly identifying your sexual minority status was not something many could risk legally or socially. In Prairie Fairies, I historicized the queer worlds created in the five major prairie cities from 1930 to 1985, including the sexual and social activity, community and political organizations that existed there. These histories are multiple and messy, from bachelor farmers and spinster school teachers through to proudly openly gay and lesbian political leaders, activists, and everyday people. Prairie Fairies conclusively illustrates that queer people were part of the prairies and that contrasting with what money might presume, a significant number didn't flee to large urban centers. They stayed in the cities, small towns and rural areas. They created membership clubs, socialized, met lovers and became politicized. Some of those took their political awareness further, becoming activists, depressed for social change, for their rights to keep their jobs, their kids, their apartments well aware of international developments in what was then called liberationist and later lesbian and gay politics, prairie activists tailored the liberationist messages to their local and regional contexts, in addition to bringing their voices to the national gay and lesbian political movement. They were building community and demanding social justice. And while those uh, demands were often met by backlash, job terminations, murder, arson at gay clubs, gay bashings and violence, there was also acceptance allyship, and in an oddly prairie sort of way, a live and let live ethos that could enable queer lives. While interviewing gay and lesbian elders, I was led to my current focus on same-sex marriage. Narrators spoke emotionally of the power and legitimacy conferred by marriage in both their families and in the community. And that spark led to my current Shirk-funded research project, which seeks to understand how the legalization of same-sex marriage in Canada changed the world. It's a bold question. 
Some will dismiss this as complete overstatement, but a few facts are in order. Canada was the third country in the world to legalize access to same-sex marriage in 2003, when Ontario and British Columbia legalized same-sex marriage. The federal decision in 2005 solidified this gain across the country. Because Canada had no residency or citizenship requirement, thousands of international couples flocked to Canada to marry. And perhaps the best known couple were Edie Windsor and Thea Spire, whose Canadian marriage led eventually to the landmark 2013 US Supreme Court decision, Windsor versus the United States, that struck down the defense of marriage legislation. While famous, Windsor and Spire were far from alone. Other couples came from England, Ireland, France, South Africa, Hong Kong, and Israel, to name several countries where Canadian marriages were at the heart of both um, litigation and activism surrounding marriage in those contexts. Utilizing legal, activist, and political strategies, they attempted to secure access to same-sex marriage in their countries, not always successfully. Love plus litigation equals marriage writes Canada into the vast international literature on same-sex marriage acquisition as it seeks to understand the historical, legal, social, cultural, and activist demands for access to what is now called equal marriage. Querying change, focused on feminism, queer communities, and marriage, underscores the value of historical analysis and history to explain how and why demands for activism and social justice take root locally, nationally, and globally and how those movements lead to changes that have, I would argue, defined late 20th and 21st century life. Thank you.